Thank you, Norm. Welcome everybody uh, to the meeting today. Uh, there's an old saying that the world is run by those that show up. And so here we are, and I'm disappointed that this hall isn't full because this is a big issue uh, in agriculture today. This is an information meeting. We have a couple of great speakers uh, this morning who really know what's happening in both the railway and the grain handling uh, system. So this is an information meeting. It's for you to learn about what's going on, to learn about what some of the problems are. It's for you to ask questions. If you've got questions burning in your mind about what's, what's going on or what is not going on, now is the time to bring those questions up. It's also an idea thing. If you've got a great idea out there to make the system work better or to really get this grain moving uh, in the long term, and it doesn't matter if it's a wild and crazy idea, uh, every new invention was once a wild and crazy idea. So that's what this meeting is all about. We want to keep it upbeat and positive, a, a learning experience. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We are very happy to have Mark Hemmes here. Mark Hemmes is the president of Quorum Corporation, which is an independent subsidiary of the Quorum Group of Companies. And Mark is a founding partner of that group of com companies. This company is based in Edmonton, Alberta, and has been responsible for monitoring Canada's prairie grain handling and transportation system since 2001. Quorum reports to the government and industry on changes in the efficiency, reliability, structure, and operation of the grain handling and transportation system and the impact that it has upon producers. Quorum and its sister companies have been called upon by the federal government to provide consultation services in related areas such as uh, container movements and most recently an examination and assessment of the Canadian grain supply chain. Mark has an extensive, maybe expensive too, <laughs> an extensive uh, experience in the transportation industry. During his 23 years with the rail industry, he has held a variety of senior positions in the field of marketing and operations. Mark attended school in Edmonton and the University of Alberta and has also completed work at the University of Western Ontario in the area of marketing. I've heard Mark speak, speak before. I don't know of anyone that understands the system and can convey it more clearly than Mark Hemmes. So Mark, welcome to the meeting, and please help me welcome Mark. Thanks very much for the, uh, for the kind words. I, I hope I can live up. What I'm gonna do, 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 is today I'm gonna go, 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 gonna go through a little bit of background on the grain handling and transportation system. A little puts a little bit of context on on what I'm gonna tell you about the way things are working, 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 working,
We measure everything from the farm gate to the time a vessel leaves a port. And we do it at a very, very high level of disaggregation. We, we look at individual carloads of grain. That's, that's the level of detail that we get into. Um, basically, what they were looking for back when we started the grain monitoring program was somebody to set an industry benchmark for the way things work. It stemmed out of the Estate Kruger Review that happened in the late 1990s. And it was made a legislative uh, reform in 2000. They went out to a tender because part of that legislative reform said that they had to pick an independent monitor of the industry. And uh, we were fortunate enough to win that contract in 2001. We've had it four times since then. So right now our, our contract is good till 2016. Uh, I hope they continue to do grain monitoring, and I hope that we're the lucky one at that point in time as well. Um, I, think, I think it's also important to, to point out the fact that as the grain monitor, it is our job to, to be neutral and balanced, and we try to do that. But, uh, and sometimes we have, to, we have to pick a side because it's right or wrong, so we call it as we see it. And, and, and uh, sometimes, 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 that makes us kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of unpopular with one, one, one side or the other. Um, <coughs> talking about the playing field, um, what does it look like? Well, first of all, um, in Canada, just on a context, we export anywhere between 27 and 31 million metric tons of grain every year. This year it's going to be more, of course but it's worth anywhere between 13 and 16 billion dollars annually. That's a big chunk of Canada's gross domestic product. It has a huge impact on the economy of this country. We move grain and sell grain to well over a thousand different destinations around the world. So what does the playing field look like? Well, a lot of you probably are familiar with this, but we, we estimate that there's around 30,000 producers in Western Canada. They're moving it to, I, I, I gotta change the slide, it's 387 here, but it's actually up to 392 now. Um, primary and process elevators in the prairies. There's two railways with 17,000 miles of track servicing those 392 elevators. 16 bulk terminals at four ports in Western Canada, and I should mention the fact that there's 11 terminals at 11 ports in Eastern Canada on top of that. Eight container terminals in Western Canada, moving grain to on 100 or over 1,500 ocean vessels every year. So we're a big player in this. Uh, Canada represents roughly about 10, anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of the total exported grain in the world every year. To give you a, a, a little bit of a perspective on how the grain handling and transportation system in Canada has changed just in the time that we have been monitoring it. When you go back to 1999, there was 1,004 elevators in 685 communities. That's, that's changed. In 2013, we were at 386 elevators in 271 communities. We're now at 292 and 272 communities. That's a huge change. And if you look at this, you can see what it's done to the, to the actual social infrastructure in Western Canada. It's big. Um, talk about production. Really quickly. If you take a look at the production, you can see on this, on this uh, graph here on the very right-hand side, that's 2013. We haven't seen a year like this. Um, it's huge, but it's been growing. On average, if you went back over the 30 years that are, that's on this graph, we see an annual increase in both be, between a point and a half and two percent a year. But in the last five or six years, we're talking two to three percent per year increase. And we see that increasing even more. So if you go back to those early years, we were talking about average annual production in the mid 40 million it's like 40 to 45 million tons. Right now, in the last five years, the average, the last five years, the average crop size has been a little over 55 million tons, and we see that going up. This is the new normal. 
And a lot of people have not got their heads around it. Everybody start, keeps thinking in terms of this being a 45 million ton uh, crop country. We're not in Another point that is really important, and especially for Saskatchewan and Alberta farmers, is the fact that we've seen a big change in the, in the movement or the flow of grain across Canada. Um, we used to move a lot through the eastern seaboard. Um, but you kind of take a look at this graph here. This is what went out over the west coast over the last 13 years. First, first eight, nine years of the grain monitoring program, West Coast movements were between 14 and 16 million tons a year. In the last four to five years, that number has jumped. It's up around 21 and a half million tons. What did I say here? 21.3 million ton, metric tons. That's a huge shift. Is it the new normal? We think it is. And we think that number is probably going to keep growing. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, who are we selling grain to? We used to sell grain predominantly back in 1990, into Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and Africa, basically into that area in, in, uh, in, in um, the former Soviet Union as well. So those, those were big, big numbers for us. By the time we get to 2010, that's changed significantly. We can see that, and even that Asian number, the difference, that it, 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 it's at 47 percent. It's even shifted so much in there because we used to sell a lot into into India and Malaysia. We're, our our traffic levels into Korea, Japan, and, and eastern or western eastern Malaysia have have gone up considerably. So it's basically really really focused on the West Coast. The other place where we've seen big increases is into Western Hemisphere countries. We're selling more and more and more traffic into, uh, into South America and Central America, far, far more than what we did 10 years ago. The other, the other point here, other than we're changing, the changing global demand, and probably more important, is what's happened to logistical economics. When you take a look at the uh, movement through the Eastern Seaboard, Basically, what we've seen is um, a lowering of, of overall lowering of ocean vessel rates right around the globe. First 10 years of the Green Monitoring Program, the average Panamax vessel was moving at about 25 to 30 thousand dollars a day. Today, that number is 10,200 per day. Throughout last year, we saw numbers down under 5 thousand dollars a day for a Panamax vessel. This is a big difference because what it does is, is that it makes that, that one fixed number, which is the seaway cost, which runs anywhere between 11 and $17 a ton, um, a big, big proportion of this. And so economically, it makes more sense to move things through the West Coast. Today, we're seeing vessels being loaded for Italy, for Spain, and even into some of the, the European uh, northern European countries. It just makes more like the, the logistical sense to move it through that, that routing. Um, northern Med, Iraq, Iran, uh, it's all going through Vancouver. One of the other things that was really predominant that we saw was um, right in the very first year in the post single desk period, we saw a doubling of the amount of Durham that went through Vancouver. Why? The, the Canadian Wheat Board always wanted to put it, you know, they, they used Durham as being a balancer that they put through the eastern seaboard, even though logistically it may not have been, been the most uh, efficient way to do it. Basically what it did was is it kept the balance and it kept the pressure off of Vancouver. So all of a sudden when the, when the wheat board was um, not controlling the, the, the logistics on it, a lot of people started pushing Durham through uh, through Vancouver. So that was that was just one example of how that changed. So let's get into what happened this year. Let's talk about 2013 production. And I'm going to go through a little bit of memory lane here because I think it's, it's important that we put this in context. Um, if you go back to June of 2013, which was less than a year ago, of course, what you'll uh, You'll remember about that is, is that we were seeding into a very, very moist soil base. 
uh, it was cold, seating was really late, and just generally, the people in the industry were looking around, and they were saying, there's a strong possibility that this year is going to be a short crop. That was in June of this year, and, and a lot of people kind of have forgotten that when I tell them these, these little talks that, and remind them, they go, yeah, that's right, we were thinking that we were in trouble. Excuse me. So you kind of get into July and you think, oh, you know what? July's not bad. We, you know, we had good moisture. Things were drying up. Seed was in the ground in most places. We had relatively mild temperatures, and it was a prolonged reproductive stage for most of the crops that were being grown. Thought, so, well, you know what? I'm not worried about a short crop anymore. So we get into August. <coughs> it just continued. Ripening was was delayed because because it was a little cooler, and and the grains they keep so then we started thinking, we could have a bumper crop. This is just in August, um, and there was no early frost. We were getting lucky all over the place. So by the time we get to September, it was great harvest conditions. The ripening had, had gone on really, really well. And there was a recognition then that we were going to have a, a record crop. We, there's a lot of talk, and, and, and I'm, I'm not an apologist for the railways, by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's important that we that I point out at this point in time that the railways always, always have looked at this, and, 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 a, and a railway doesn't gear up overnight. They have to put a forecast together, and they've got to make a determination of what they need for resources in terms of locomotives and crews six to eight months out. And so they looked at this and they said, okay, well, you know what, let's just plan and move on what we did last year and we should be okay. And so they went in September, they met with the grain companies and they said, you know, we're kind of planning to move uh, what we did last year. And the grain company says, well, we think it's going to be more than that. Well, and they said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll commit to move 5,000, 5,500 cars per week. That's what we'll spot in the country and then we should all be safe. And everybody agreed that that's a pretty good idea. So that's where we were in September. <laughs> Stats Canada comes out in September and says, okay, it's a 65 million ton crop, and we all went, wow, 65 million tons, that's pretty good. A lot of people in the trade were going, no, it's not 65 million tons. They were saying it's probably 70, 75 million tons, but this is what the, the official line was. People realized quite early on we had a significant crop, a significant opportunity. And as I said, railways and shippers agreed that 5,500 was about the right number. Stats Canada comes out in November and says that the final number, or their final estimate, is about 75.9 million metric tons in Western Canada. Biggest crop in the history of this country. So, where does that put us now? Well, if you take a look at where we're at right now, with a 75.9 production, our carrying was really low. 4.9 million metric tons, largely because we sold ourselves out of canola. Um, 55.4 million tons, as I said earlier, is about what our average annual uh, production is for the last five years. Average carry-in is about 8.1 million tons. That's what we look for. So we're considerably higher than what we normally would by about 27% in the total supply or what we have to think about moving in, in this crop here. Uh, you run through the numbers there really quickly. Our, our average domestic U.S. movement on a five-year average basis is about 30 million tons a year. Um, the shipments to port on average are 26.1 million metric tons. Uh, last year we did pretty close to 29 million tons. Um, total marketing's about 55 million tons. Bottom line is, what we're looking at this year is a carryout of about 25 million tons. Now, you're going to hear a lot of numbers get thrown out. There's, there's some people who are going as low as 20 million tons. There's some people who are saying 30 million tons. This is our estimate. And by the way, it's all going to change next week. It all depends on how much grain will the railways be able to move between now and August 1st. And we're nervous about that. If you take a look, 
this is where we're going to get into talking about what's going on today. And this is May 26, ending February 2nd. Uh, tonight, when I get home, I'll do this week's for week 27. Uh, I've already looked at some of the numbers and they're not changing. Uh, in this graph, if you can see that very top, the, the top graph is the country stocks. That's what's in the country elevator network today in the four western provinces. That little blue line there is the five-year average. The gold bar is where we were last year, and the red bar shows where we are this year. And, or, sorry, the red bar is last year, the gold, gold bar is this year. We are consistently up around the 3.6, 3.5 million metric tons. Uh, in, the in the country elevator network, which represents anywhere between 92 and 95 percent of the working capacity. Bottom line is, elevators are full to the rafters. And every time they load a train, they go out and they buy as much grain as they possibly can and fill it right back up to the rafters. That has been evidenced week after week after week since week six of this crop year. It just doesn't stop, and they don't get enough um, they're not getting enough rail car capacity to move and empty out that, that system. And the proof is, now the bottom line, the bottom graph is the terminal stocks. That's the stocks at the terminals and the ports. Again, the blue line is the four, five year average. The gold line is this, this year, the red line is last year. You look at those gold bars on that graph and you can see that we are incredibly low somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of what the working capacity is in those elevators. Some of the great companies have told me that they've never seen stock levels this low in all their careers. Some of these guys have been there for 35, 40 years, they've never seen stocks this low. So what we have is, and, and, and I'll, I'll quote Wade on this one, so I'm going to steal this thunder. We've got way too much inventory in the country and we don't have enough inventory at the port. So the problem must exist between the country and the port. So where, who is that? <coughs> Excuse me. If you take a look at what the unload performance is for the railways in each one of the ports uh, in Western Canada, da, 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 uh, you can see where we are in Vancouver. Uh, the variance to the five-year average is just 1% higher. Uh, if, you very, if you compare it to what we did last year, it's 4%. Prince Rupert, it's uh, a little bit higher than what the five-year average, but compared to last year, is, is uh, pretty much even. Overall, on the West Coast, 3% down. Thunder Bay, as I told you earlier, is really, really down, largely because we've seen this major shift in the uh, flow of traffic. They're down 19%. Overall, uh, and Churchill, by the way, was up 25%. They went up to, uh, and their shipments actually were a little bit north of 600,000 tons this year, which was really good for them. But overall, unloads at the ports this year compared to last year is 6% down. This is the railways that said that they would do the same as last year, and then they made commitments of 5,000 to 5,500 cars per week. By the way, in, in each one of these quarters, and if you add it up, they're doing between 37 and 3,900 cars per week, not 5,000. Uh, really quickly, you can see on the graph here, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, Vancouver down four. Prince Rupert even, uh, Thunder Bay way down, and uh, now we'll talk about vessel windows. In, in Vancouver, <coughs> we're setting records. Um, and, and a little bit of background and history to this. Normally a vessel lineup in Vancouver is eight to 10 vessels. Um, three years ago, we had a big problem that was basically the first indication, or the beginning of an indication that this was a longer term issue. Um, everybody was, was distressed about the fact that we were seeing vessel lineups in excess of 20 vessels. We were freaked out. It's funny, I was talking to somebody who was in the industry 
working at this back in the mid-90s, and they were remembered back in the 93-94 period when we had the huge calamity that became a, a, a lawsuit and eventually started the Estee Kruger Review. The vessel items back then were in the mid-teens and everybody was freaked out. Last year we hit, an, or last week we hit a new record in Vancouver. We were at 36 vessels. Now, of course, they can't all fit in the harbor in Vancouver. They're, but every single anchorage in Vancouver is taken up and they've moved about a dozen vessels out into the Georgia Straits and they've got them anchored everywhere from Victoria all the way up to North and Northern Ireland. Um, this is a problem. Um, it's a problem because it reflects on Canada's ability to move traffic. It, it uh, really hurts us um, in many ways, but where it really affects producers is, is that everyone, but we figure about two thirds of those vessels are at demerge already. And all that demerge ends up getting fed back and it shows up in the basis eventually. Further, most of those ships have got sails attached to them where the grain companies are having to pay uh, penalties because they're out of contract. They're not meeting the time frame in which the contract contracts were made for. Prince Rupert, same story. I, I dearly hope somebody takes a picture of the vessels that are parked in the harbor in Prince Rupert because they've never seen this many ships in the harbor in Prince Rupert. There's 13 vessels up there right now, just grain ships. It doesn't include the container ships or the coal ships or anything that goes up there. Just grain, 13 vessels. It's got to be a sight to see. Where's this problem come from? And, and here, here's where, where we come back to this idea of, of looking at what is the commitment that the railways have made in so far as uh, capacity is concerned. They've gone to the grain companies and they've said, okay, we're going to move, we're going to spot X number of cars in, in the, in the uh, country every week. What we do, the only thing that we can do as the grain monitor right now because of a lack of data is, is that we compare what the week before's car allocation plan is that it was published by the grain companies. And we manage, we, and we measure that against what was um, actually unloaded in, at the ports. So essentially we're using unloads at the port as a proxy for what was spotted the week before in the country. Logical. Uh, nobody's told us that that's a bad ass assumption, so we keep going with that. And what you see here on this graph at the very top is two years worth of Vancouver and two years worth of Prince Rupert. And just this crop year alone in the Vancouver corridor, um, they're 22% below what their actual allocation was in terms of what their actual unloads were. It represents about 23,800 cars. And if you do the math on that, follow it all the way through, it pretty much loads about 36 boats. And the same thing down in, in Prince Rupert. It's a bigger issue in Prince Rupert, even though it doesn't seem like it. There's 3,250 cars off of what the actual plan was, but there's 13 vessels up there waiting for grain. Uh, they're not moving nearly what they could. And the same thing happens in Vancouver as in Prince Rupert. There is a commitment that's not being met, and this is why we end up with shortfalls. And it, and it reflects back into the country because the grain companies are buying or planning to buy grain from producers at a rate that allows them to fill those vessels, and when they can't move it, they can't buy it. That's the bottom line. Now, Fair, to be fair, and if you look at what the grain, what the railways have done over the last 10 years, um, a lot of people will say, well, they've done nothing. Well, they have done something. There's a couple of points that we would make here, just to be fair. Um, if you look at the 10-year average of unloads across all four western ports um, over the last 10 years, you can see that picture. One is, is that they are servicing the peak period in the fall, but as soon as Christmas hits, it gets cold and they always drop down. That doesn't say that demand changes during that period. Basically, that's what they what they deliver. But if you look at it on a five-year basis, you can see that the capacity that they're putting into the system is increasing. When you look at it on a three-year average, it increases even more. 
but we still have that pronounced drop as soon as December hits. And it doesn't mean that demand has gone. What that is is that that's their delivery program. Another point that we would make about what's happened with railway performance over the last 13 years is how they've performed in terms of loaded transit. Now, that loaded transit is an important number for a lot of reasons. It, it, it has gone down from eight to nine days for a trip from Vancouver or from the country to uh, all of the four western ports to about five point eight days. Well, that's 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 a pretty pretty serious improvement, um, and it shows a lot of effort 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 on their part. But it's also 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 important that the major beneficiary of having reduced transit time is the railways because it reduces what their capital costs are. Fast, faster you move the car means it, it increases the capacity of the rail fleet, which means that you have to invest less capital in both track and in, in uh, car fleet. So this, you know, this, this, this whole idea of an asset utilization, this is where it comes to point. <coughs> Excuse me again. If you take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the blue line, and, and that blue line represents what we uh, measure as a reliability. The statistical name for it is coefficient of variation, or CV. And, and it's basically a, a formula that uses a standard deviation of what the average is. The bottom line is, is that it comes out 0.32 for the last six years. There hasn't been a lot of improvement in the last six years in, ter in terms of reliability, and that's like saying that it's 5.8 days plus or minus 32%. If you're a grain company and you're in a normal period and you're trying to plan with 32% worth of variability in a logistics plan, that's pretty near impossible. And that's one of the challenges that grain companies have in trying to work with the railways with that kind of variability. They're improving on their own uh, transit times, but the reliability is still iffy. Over, over the total period of time, they've gone from a uh, 0.4 to a 0.32. Another point that I would make about railways, and, and I think it's important to make this, I think way more has done into this a little bit as well, is the fact that the railway marketplace, or the grain marketplace, is unique, it's different. And a lot of people don't appreciate that fact. In Western Canada, of the 392 facilities that load grain, there are four that are served by both railways. All of the rest of them are served by one railway or the other. There's about a dozen of them out there that have got access to new switching, and 14 of them have access to, to new switching. And they're, they're sort of competitive. But the fact is, is that of those 14, there's only <clears throat> eight of them that, that can actually load, load unit train. So bottom line is, is that roughly about 90% of the capacity, the grain capacity in Western Canada, is capital. That's unique, because basically it says that from the railway perspective, they don't have to worry about competitive interference. They don't have to worry about loss of market share. They don't have to worry about um, another competition coming and taking the traffic. Basically, they can move it when they want. For their, from their perspective, from the shareholder's perspective, this is brilliant. And by the way, the railways didn't do something nefarious to make this happen. This is, this is the way that our system has evolved. So when you want to look at what the railway market share has been over the last 13 years, between CN and CP, that green line shows what the fluctuations are on a percent year over year. But the blue and the red lines, that's what the actual market share is. If you do an average over 13 years, it works out to be 50-50. It really doesn't change that much. In those years where we saw the big swings, those were the droughts and the floods. Basically, you've got CP and Socian and North, and that's the way it is. So what does it all mean in the end? 
from the perspective of the producer. It means that you've got falling prices, widening bases, lack of delivery opportunities. There's a lot of producers, and we hear it every day, who are in cash flow crunch, and you've got bins that are full of grain. We estimated, actually just yesterday, that we've still probably got about um, a little bit better than 40 million tons in bins on the market today, still. I think I'm close. Um, grain companies, not, not a happy situation for them either. <coughs> they're, happy, they're, they're, they're having a wide new basis. That's a market signal, that's a reality. And, and Mike and, and Wade will probably talk about this as well, but grain companies don't really like that. They want to be moving as much grain as they can, and they want to be buying it as fast as they can. So a widening basis doesn't do a lot for their business a lot at all. They've got vessel to merge costs. And while they pass on uh, a portion of it, there's a big part of it that they've got to eat as well. On top of the contract extension costs, the penalties, that doesn't put them in a very good light. Next time they go around to sell grain, they're going to get pressured because they're going to he said, well, you couldn't deliver last year. Why should I buy from you this year? That's going to be a problem for us in the future. There are going to be lost opportunities for additional volumes. They, they see this, this huge opportunity this year, and it's kind, of, it's kind of passing on us. And, of course, they're going to be pressured to revisit the shipping protection legislation, which is very costly for them. Um, from the railway's perspective, though, this is guaranteed volumes, 18 to 24 months out. Both Hunter Harrison and Claude Langeau have gone on the record saying that this is a good thing for them. It's an opportunity because it reduces it, it reduces what their operating costs are in movement. It enhances their revenues. And it gives them the opportunity to turn around and say, well, if you pay us more, we move more. So get rid of the revenue cap. And they, but the other side of it is, is that they've got to be questioning, and, I, and I'm sure that they are, what is their long-term capacity for some of this, and they've got to start to make some strategic choices. Here's where I'm going to talk about the revenue cap. A lot of, a lot of uh, people misunderstand what the cap is, and I think probably calling it a cap is a misnomer, uh, because it's not a cap. Really what it is, is it's a, it's a mechanism that provides a statutory limit on the amount of grain, uh, amount of revenue that a railway can charge. They, it, it effectively controls what the rate structure is and it makes sure that railways do not put an increase on the rail freight rate that exceeds a price indices that is cap, uh, calculated annually by the uh, Canadian Transportation Agency. It does not penalize the railways for handling more grain, for handling a longer length of haul, or any of the inflationary effects that they have to suffer with, you know, everything from fuel to pension cost increases. The railways do have the ability to set rates, and they do, and they do it regularly. They, they reflect differential differences in the price by, by looking at the commodity type, the geographic location, either origin or destination. They, they have seasonal differentiation of, of rates. The uh, price differential for the car block size, those are the multi-car block incentive rates that are four and eight dollars a ton. Uh, they differentiate the grain movements so that they ensure that Railways or, or that, that uh, grain companies will follow a specific route. Right now, they are pricing Vancouver at the lowest level because they want to direct as much traffic as they can to the west coast as they possibly can. <laughs> Vancouver and Prince Rupert. Now, just to kind of give you a history going all the way back to 1980, um, and back in 1980 is when the Crow rate changed. Railways were being paid five dollars a ton, and there wasn't any any kind of add-on for them. And so finally, the current rate debate ended. The railways started to get a benefit of it, and they said, "Well, over time, what we're going to do is we're going to decrease the uh, benefits. We're going to make farmers pay more." Bottom line, but you can see that benefit 
was what was paid for by the by the government. And that was an instant bonus for the railways. The other thing that happened was is that they were giving them the ability to abandon track. What year of dollars did those are? Uh, those those are those are constant nineteen eighty dollars actually. Um, then you can see where we, we, we went through the maximum rate scale period. That's when when uh, rates were being set by the CTA. And then we get into the revenue cap. And you can see that the railways have benefited considerably during the period of time in the rev during the revenue cap where we've seen some serious increases in rates, particularly in the last two years. Under the revenue cap, that's basically the picture. I know it's very, very busy, but essentially what it tells you is, is that they are not they are not wed to one system of pricing. You can see what they're doing on a month-to-month -month basis, a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. They are pricing differentially. <coughs> they are trying they're, they're pricing in such a way that they can optimize their own position. If you look at it just in the last five years, you can see what the variable uh, CPI is that the CTA is awarded for each of these. Um, five years ago, it was uh, it was allowed to go up eight percent, then they brought it down seven percent, and they put it up again seven percent. Last year was three and a half percent. This year it was nine point seven percent. So, I think the point here is is that. Under the revenue cap, when it comes to rate increases, the railways aren't hurting them that bad. And you can see how the allowable rate per time has increased from $30 to $34. That's all the average rate that the railways have been paid per ton in Western Canada for Western Rain Movement. $34 bucks is pretty good. It's higher than what the average is for everybody else, especially in the bulk mine side. Higher than potash, higher than oil, higher than coal, higher than sulfur. Bottom line, and, and I think probably the, it's better, rather than calling it the revenue cap, I would try to get people to call it the maximum revenue entitlement. And in fact, the guys at CP call it that now because they don't particularly like the idea of calling it a cap either. But it's a misnomer. It doesn't place an absolute cap on, on the railway revenues. There is no evidence, zero, that says by paying the railways more in a market like this, that you're gonna get better service. So I always ask myself, when the people say that they wanna get rid of the revenue cap, what do you think you're gonna get? You're gonna pay them more money, but are you gonna get better service? There's no, there's no evidence that that's going to happen. So, and I think there's another point that needs to be really, really, really stressed here. This is that if you took away the revenue cap, where's that cost going to go? If you take away the revenue cap, the rates are going to go up. Who's going to pay that? It's going to end up back in the producer's check. It's going to get taken off you. So the producer's going to pay more for it. I think that's important, but most of all, an increase to the cost of moving grain is going to have an impact on our competitiveness internationally in the global marketplace. We have to understand that. So, all I would say, and I've said this a number of times, is, is that I think it's a good time to have a discussion about the revenue cap. I think it's a good thing that it be put out on the table and talked about. But before you give it up, understand what you're giving up and understand what you're going to get in return. If that's the way it's going to go. Because if all they're going to do is take it away and pay the railways more, where's the benefit? Going forward, this is my last slide, and we get off here, is uh, this is the largest grain crop in Canadian history. Boy, is that ever a statement that is obvious. But I think what it requires is that it really amplifies and, and put, puts a focus on the fact that we need to change the way the system we need to have some serious discussions about some of the initiatives that need to happen in order to make this thing work better. Some of the challenges, though, for this year that we've got to focus on is the special congestion of Vancouver and Prince Rupert. 
It's a major concern. You've got to focus on that. The issue of railway car supply is just as important. It is part of that problem. And the consistency of the service that they provide, both in car supply as well as the time it takes to get it to the port. Port terminal capacity in Vancouver in particular is going to become a bigger issue as we go forward. They're sold out. Don't forget this. It's not that they don't have the capacity to move more grain, but they sell their, their capacity based on what they think the railways can deliver to them. If the rural railways could deliver more, the capacity would go up probably another 20 to 30 percent. But based on what they think they can get from the railways, they just they're saying, look at don't don't plan on us moving anything more because we don't think the railways can service it. We have huge price impacts because of this. You suffer it every day as producers because the basis is widening. widening. It's largely the fault of this. And of course, country space is a huge issue. We have to find a way to start clearing it up. So at that point in time, I would say thank you. And uh, I don't know whether you want any questions till after or